in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and praise for this day. It's time for us to be together to dive into your word. We pray on this Labor Day for all of those who work and the dignity of work, all of the work of their hands, that it would be aligned with the gifts, talents, mission, and purpose you have given each one of us. And help us to see dignity in our own work, whatever that is, to see the purpose behind it that you have given us, Lord. And to do all things, all work, for your greater glory. And so as we gather together and look at this passage for this upcoming Sunday, this gospel, we pray, Lord, that it would compel us to work, act, speak, walk in ways that are more aligned, more in accordance with you, your will, and your plan for our lives. Help us to really ask ourselves the hard questions about who you are to us and to be ready and willing to be in relationship with you, creating time for that relationship each and every day. Challenge us, bless us, affirm us, heal us, and anything that might be distracting us as we dive into this passage, anything that might be weighing heavy on our hearts, we just ask, Lord, that you would cast those things out, that you would take them to yourself. We lay them at your feet. We give them to you, and we ask that your will be done. We pray all this in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome. This is a pre-recorded Bible study, so please feel free if you're watching this live. really want to encourage you to use the live chat feature, and if you're watching this later or watching it live, please use the comments. So as you're going, if you have questions, if you just have something that stands out to you that you want to share, uh, interact that way, and we'll be able to get back to you, answer questions later on if you leave that there. So this uh, evening, this Bible study, we will be in Mark chapter 8. Verses 27 through 35. Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 35. This is the gospel for this upcoming Sunday, and it happens a little bit after our reading from this past Sunday, the healing of a deaf man. A few things happen in the middle. Jesus heals uh, or feeds about 4,000 people somewhere in the Decapolis area. The Pharisees come and they begin to ask for more signs, and so he criticizes them. And then he goes down to Bethsaida, which is a town. Uh, on the uh, border of the Sea of Galilee, and he heals a blind man. And then we have this story. So we're going to read this twice through, first time through, just get a picture for what is being said. Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 35. Now Jesus and his disciples set out for the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Along the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? They said in reply, John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter said to him in reply, You are the Messiah. Then he warned them not to tell anyone about him. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and rise after three days. He spoke this openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. At this, he turned around and, looking at his disciples, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. He summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and that of the gospel will save it. The Gospel of the Lord. So now that we've read this once through, I invite you to listen more deeply. Uh, If this picture is not already fresh in your mind, try and paint a brand new picture of this story you've heard many times before. Um, But pay special attention to the words as they are read. Close your eyes or focus on them in the text. Try and focus on every single word or phrase as it's read and see if anything stands out to you, sparks a thought in your mind, a memory, an idea, reminds you of something going on in your own life or from this past week. 
that might be some way that Jesus is trying to speak to you through this passage. And so I invite you to just sit with those things, underline them, highlight them, share them in the chat and the comments, and think about why that stood out to you. What is God trying to say to you? What might he be compelling you to do? Now Jesus and his disciples set out for the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Along the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? They said in reply, John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter said to him in reply, you are the Messiah. Then he warned them not to tell anyone about him. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and rise after three days. He spoke this openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. At this he turned around and, looking at his disciples, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. He summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and that of the gospel will save it. The Gospel of the Lord. So I invite you to take a look at the things that stood out to you and just take the next uh, few moments to share those things in the chat. Any questions that you have that resonate with you, share those in the chat or in the comments if you're not watching this live. Uh, we'd love to see those comments in the chat uh, or those things in the comments and in the chat um, so we can answer them later. So even if it's just, hi, I'm watching, or if you want to like this video, subscribe to our channel, whatever it is, but just take a moment to share a little bit of what stood out to you, um, and if you'd like to, also, why you think it did, as well as any questions that you have. Great, so let's get into this text. Please feel, feel, feel free throughout the whole course of this to continue sharing things in the chat um, and as well as in the comments, especially if you have a question, throw that in the comments so we can answer that later. Verse 27, so now Jesus and his disciples set out for the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Well, set out from where? Where are they? So they, uh, right before this, were in a town called Bethsaida, which is on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. And so this is the area in which Jesus um, had just traveled away from in the area of Tyre and Sidon and now came back to for this particular healing. And it seems as though he's going to come back and do ministry in the area where he's uh, set his kind of hometown during his adult ministry years, which is in Capernaum. And Bethsaida is not too far from that. Instead, he goes to Caesarea Philippi. This is 25 miles north. And this is the only thing that happens there, is this interaction that we have. And then he makes his way back down to the mount where he has the transfiguration in chapter 9. And so this is pretty significant. Like, why would Jesus go to this particular city, back up in Gentile territory, for this particular conversation? So the, the city of Caesarea Philippi, it used to be called Peneus. And Peneus was named for the uh, pagan god Pan. And there was a temple to the god Pan where sacrifices, often human sacrifices, were offered. Uh, and that, uh, you can see more of a parallel to this in the Gospel of Matthew's account of this in Matthew 16. But there was this hole in the earth um, that was sometimes nicknamed the gates of the netherworld. And people would throw human sacrifices, children, whatever that might be, to the god Pan to appease or to offer uh, pleasing sacrifices to that false god. And so... You see, when in the 
account of Matthew, where Matthew says, uh, Jesus says to Peter, the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. When he says, I will uh, build my church upon you, Peter, that's significant. Another significant thing about this particular city is that it's built into a giant rock face. And so when Jesus goes up there in the account in Matthew and says, Peter, you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, it's significant because these pagan kind of churches or temples were, were built on this rock of the city of Caesarea Philippi. It was a rock face um, and city that was about 500 um, feet wide and 100 feet tall. This rock face where all these different idols were carved out, and on the top of it was this temple to the god Pan. And now when the Rome, Romans took over, there was another temple that was constructed to uh, Caesar, I think specifically to Caesar Augustus. So it was also a Roman um, kind of settlement, and Caesar, whoever the Caesar was at the time, was kind of considered a demigod. So there is another symbol of idolatry there. It is called Caesarea Philippi because Philip was the tetrarch, the Jewish, um, kind of um, somewhat Jewish uh, secular leader of that territory when the land had been broken into parts after Herod the Great had died. And so you have kind of a naming of a city and construction in the city that's associated with pagan worship, with Roman idol worship and Roman governing, and then Jewish secular governance. And so a lot of things that Jesus is opposed to and that Jesus is kind of trying to turn upside down and create a different, uh, something completely different from, are all represented in this geographical location. So uh, that's why I think it's significant that he goes to this particular city and why he doesn't just say this in Capernaum or in Bethsaida, why he makes a point to travel an extra 25 miles there, 25 miles back to have this particular conversation. Verse, uh, continuing in verse 27, along the way, he asked his disciples. Now this phrase, the way, is ti hodo, and it's used first in the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark. And so you would think like if we were using this phrase, we'd say, oh, I'm on the way to the grocery store. That's not actually what it means in the original Greek. In Mark chapter 1, verse 2, the other place this is used is where it's talking about John the Baptist and the prophecy from Isaiah, where it says, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way. Te hodo, that's used there as well. It's not used again until this interaction. And then it's used a few times after this in chapter 9, verse 33, where um, Jesus um, is on his, is giving this talk about the uh, greatest in the kingdom when he comes to Capernaum. And he asks them, what are you arguing about on the way? On the way where? On the way to our next city? No, there's some kind of particular purpose. Someone's going to prepare your way for a particular thing. And then it's used a few more times in chapter 10, specifically in verse 32 and verse 52. Um, verse 52 is more blatant in the English translation, where Jesus is interacting with another blind man, Bartimaeus, and he says, go on your way, the, your faith has saved you. Immediately he received his sight and followed him on the way. And then what happens right after this? The entry into Jerusalem. And so this phrase, the way, those are the only places in the Gospel of Mark that phrase is used, are set up at the very beginning of Mark to talk about a particular purpose for the Messiah that is being prepared for. And now it's kind of culminating in this moment and then continues to be mentioned on their way down to Jerusalem where Jesus will fulfill what that way, that plan is by being crucified. So this isn't just a phrase that's like, oh, on the way or along the journey. This is like along the path of your purpose, along the reason you came, on the way there, Jesus in this city asks his disciples, and this is the question he asks them, who do people say that I am? Now, this is interesting. He asked a couple questions in the previous stories leading up to this that we didn't read in last week's gospel. Uh, when the Pharisees come and question him right before this, when he is uh, still, I think, in the region of the Decapolis uh, or in Dalmantha, Dalmantha um, which I think is near that region, um, the Pharisees come up and Jesus asks them, do you not yet understand or comprehend? And then he says again in chapter 8, verse 21, do you still not understand? And then right after that, he heals a blind man. Do you see anything? Is a question that he asks. And so he keeps kind of questioning. Do you not understand? Do you not see? Do you see? And it's kind of used as a literary parallel to this. Like, who do people say that I am? Who do people understand me to be? Who do people see when they see me? 
And so the apostles, the disciples answer in verse 28. They say in reply, John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. John the Baptist had already been killed by Herod. He'd been beheaded because of an interaction that a promise that he made um, because he had drank too much in front of his daughter, and she asked for the plate of John the Baptist on the head because John the Baptist uh, had criticized the marriage um, of Herod and her mother, and her mother kind of asked for her daughter to request this. And so John the Baptist has been killed, but he was the first prophet to be around in a few hundred years, and he was a very mysterious person. A lot of people flocked to him. He was out in the middle of nowhere in the Dead Sea, so he kind of probably at this time, and Based on what we see in the text, there's evidence of the fact that he kind of had this mythological air about him. He was someone very special. A lot of people thought he could have been the Messiah. They question him all through the Gospels. But every time he says, no, one greater than I is coming. And then we have Elijah. Elijah was taken up into heaven. There's actually beautiful artistic depictions about art, uh, Elijah being taken up into heaven on a chariot of fire after he uh, gives his double portion of his spirit to his predecessor, um, Elisha. Um, and so there was a lot of prophecies and thought that Elijah was going to return one day, and a lot of prophecies about the end times. Some probably even suspected that the Son of Man or the Messiah would be a new Elijah and a new David, a new prophet and a new king, which he is, but it's not Elijah. And then still others, one of the prophets, and the prophets were very kind of mysterious people. They did weird things. Elijah laid on his side in the middle um, uh, you know, of the street for, I think, a year, eating his food off um, burning animal feces. And, he, um, and Jeremiah went and had this weird prophecy where he had to go wear uh, underwear and then hide it in a rock and then go find it. And it was all um, you know, torn up and moldy. And that was a symbol for Israel. So there are these kind of questionable people. Like they did some weird stuff and they were very mysterious. And so a lot of like rumors about the Messiah and all these prophecies in the Jewish uh, text, the Jewish Old, our Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, all pointed to these kind of people maybe coming back. And these three people are actually the exact people that Herod, Herod was Jewish. Um, he was kind of half Jewish and not really practicing faithfully. But these are the three people that Herod suspects that Jesus might be. When it says in chapter 6 of Mark, Herod's opinion of Jesus in verse 14, King Herod heard about it for his fame had become widespread. And people were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why his mighty powers are at work in him. Others were saying, he's Elijah. Still others, he is a prophet like any of the prophets. And so that kind of uh, gets Herod a little scared. So he and people were obviously thinking this. The disciples are reiterating that to Jesus. But then he asks the central question. And this is the question that I think you and I need to constantly ask ourselves. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? In the Greek, the you is emphatic. It says, you, however, whom do you pronounce me to be? That's probably the best translation from the original Greek. You, however, whom do you pronounce me to be? Emphasizing the you. You know, I think a lot of us have a personally curated version of Jesus. You know, a version of Jesus that makes our life, our faith more comfortable, doesn't challenge us, really aligns with everything that we are choosing to do or not do, and doesn't ever challenge or convict us to be uncomfortable, to change, to transform beyond the little things that we might ebb and flow between on a given daily or weekly basis. And the truth is, there is only one Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is not a way, a truth, or a lifestyle. So if we have this kind of perfect curated person of Jesus that is very comfortable and easy for us to follow, we really have to ask our, the question, who is this Jesus I'm following? Who do I say that he is? Is he the image I have in my mind? Or is he someone I'm trying to be in relationship with and learn about and constantly be challenged to grow and change by? Who do you say that I am? Peter, being the leader, being the bold one, the one who's willing to say, Peter said to him in reply, you are the Messiah. Now, Messiah in Hebrew, Mashiach, has the same meaning as the word Christ in Greek, Christos. Both those words mean the anointed one. 
Now this word had become associated with this messianic figure that was promised in the Old Testament that was going to come and restore the 12 tribes of Israel, restore the temple, restore proper worship, restore the kingdom of David, and overthrow all of the secular oppression from all of these empires that had taken over. The Assyrians, and then the Babylonians, and then the Medes, and then the Persians, and then the Greeks, and now the Romans, and all of these people, and way back when it was the Egyptians. All of these people that the Hebrews had been under the yoke of, all of these prophecies for centuries had been building up, promising one day that will no longer be the case. The Messiah will come, the promised one, in the line of David, the anointed one. And in the Old Testament, the Jews, and still probably in this time, the Jews anointed three types of people, priests, prophets, and kings. And Jesus is all three of those. He is the high priest. He is the prophet. Prophet means mouth. He is the mouthpiece of God. He is God himself speaking only truth. And he is the king of kings. And each one of us, when we're baptized, we're baptized into the person, the ministry, the family of Jesus. And so we also have a priestly office, a prophetic office, and a royal office. We're meant to go out and be priests to the world. Not to perform sacraments, that's the clerical priesthood. But we're meant to be kingdom priests out to the world. So our priests minister, minister to us, we go minister to the wor world. We're meant to go speak truth out into the world as prophets. And we're meant in our royal office to recognize our dignity and the dignity of every single person on earth by doing acts of service and social justice and standing up where people are not being treated with dignity. All of that manifests in the person of Jesus and the fact that he is in this moment being called the Messiah, the anointed one, the culmination of all those who were anointed in the Old Testament. And anointing, by the way, was a pouring on of oil, uh, usually to signify that something is very, very special, set apart by God. God commands this to happen many times, and oil has a lot of amazing properties. It's healing. It can soothe. Um, it can be used, obviously, as a vital uh, thing in cooking or in medicine and all these different facets of their life. Oil was essential. But in these moments of anointing, anointing was always associated with things or people that were meant to be set apart for worship or for something special, especially associated with God. So, Peter saying, you are the Messiah, carries with it all that imagery. Then, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. We have this messianic secret popping up again. And I think it's appropriate that it's mentioned here, because as I said before, we have that phrase, the way. And all before this, in the, you know, eight or seven and a half chapters before this, Jesus is still asking people, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone. And then finally, when he starts to say, when we're on our way, when we're ready to start going to where we are meant to be, meaning for me to go and die for the sins of mankind and rise from the dead, that is when that secret can kind of begin to be unveiled. So in this moment, he tells them not to tell anyone else about him so that they can still get to Jerusalem so he can fulfill his mission. But what does he do? Now it says in verse 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer greatly. You know, he reveals this now that they've already seen his power and his authority. So, for instance, if someone had come on the scene in first century Israel and said, I am the Messiah, and everyone was getting excited, and before they did anything or established their power or authority, just said, and I'm going to suffer and die, I'm going to be crucified, people would be like, you're crazy. That doesn't make any sense. How are you going to help us? How are you going to overthrow Rome? How are you going to restore Israel if you do that? You are definitely not the Messiah. So he's done all of this work to show that he is who he says he is. But it wasn't just for his own benefit. He wanted to come and heal, to seek and save the lost. That was his mission. And so he does that, but it also establishes this sense of relationship and credibility with the apostles, with the disciples, so that he can now teach them this very hard teaching that you find in the Old Testament prophecies, but had not been interpreted in a way that it was the dominant view of what the Messiah was going to be like. Um, so. He reveals, he began to teach them that the Son of Man, the Son of Man is someone who um, Ezekiel sometimes is called the Son of Man, and the Son of Man is referenced in some of Ezekiel's prophecies, but this is especially associated with Daniel chapter 7, where it says there's a Son of Man coming on a cloud uh, from the Ancient of Days on his throne, this uh, manifestation of God coming to redeem everyone. And this is the 
title that Jesus most often uses for himself. Not Messiah, not Son of God, because Messiah had all these Jewish connotations that Jesus wasn't going to fulfill, and Son of God was a secular term that even Caesar would use for himself that Jesus didn't necessarily want to associate with, even though he is the Son of God. But he didn't want it to be interpreted as, oh, I'm the Son of a God, just like a a Roman ruler. Um, That's not how he saw himself. So this is the title that he most often uses for himself, and he says, must suffer greatly. The word must there, dei in Greek, it's almost essential. This is part of the plan. This is why I came to reconcile humanity with God. And he goes to do that in Jerusalem. Now, was the plan from the very beginning for him to be crucified? I don't know. It was definitely for him to die because he came to live a human life and all humans die. Maybe he would have been assumed up into heaven. Who knows? But he came to reconcile us in a particular way. And he was fine with how that way culminated. And I think he knew the whole time that that was how it was going to end. Could it have ended a different way? Sure. Maybe everyone would have listened. Who knows? But this is how it happened. And that he must suffer greatly. Again, I said this is a very difficult teaching for the Jews Jews to hear probably at this time because this was not on their radar that this is what the Messiah was going to do. However, you see this pop up all over the place in uh, the Old Testament, particularly in Isaiah. And that's in Isaiah um, chapters, I believe, 52 to 53 where you have these songs about the suffering servant. Uh, In Isaiah 52, starting in verse 13, and it goes through verse 53, and I want to read just 53, verse 4 and forward. Yet it was our pain that he bore, our sufferings he endured. We thought of him as stricken, struck down by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our sins, crushed for our iniquity. He bore the punishment that makes us whole. By his wounds we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, all following our own way, but the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though harshly treated, he submitted and did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to slaughter, or a sheep silent before shearers, he did not open his mouth. Seized and condemned, he was taken away. Who would have thought any more of his destiny? For he was cut off from the land of the living, struck for the sins of his people." Now, if I were to read that to you and I would have just told you it was from the Bible, you would have assumed that was about Jesus. But this was written in the prophecy of Isaiah. That's uh, the fourth suffering servant song. And Isaiah was written sometime during uh, the beginning of the exile. And so that's at least seven, eight hundred years before Jesus, leading up to that moment of exile in the seventh century before Christ. And so this has been something they were waiting for. Now, a lot of people paid more attention to all of the prophecies that were about hope, restoration, coming back from exile, rebuilding under someone in the line of David. So they had that power in mind, and they had forgotten about this suffering servant. But that is who Jesus is. Must suffer greatly and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. Those three groups, elders, chief priests, and scribes, they form a group called the Sanhedrin. That is the kind of uh, judgment seat the uh, Supreme Court, kind of, of the Jewish hierarchical and religious system at the time. And that is the group, um, head by Caiaphas, the high priest, formerly Annas, his father, uh, as high priest, who condemn Jesus to death, uh, or at least judge him and then persuade Pontius Pilate to condemn him to death because the Jews can only order um, lashes. They cannot condemn someone to death. They need Rome's, uh, Rome's law to do that because it's against Jewish law to do that. Um, and be killed, and rise after three days. He spoke this openly. So Jesus, before this, he speaks in parables. Sometimes he says things mysterious. The disciples are like, what the heck is going on? And now he's just like, look, you've seen all that everything is going to happen. You know who I am. You've confessed it. So now I can tell you that you know who I am. I've got to break down this image you might have in your mind of that we're going to go in and overthrow Jerusalem and Rome and that it's going to be like the glory days and we're going to be these valiant soldiers in battle. No, I'm going to go and I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. But after three days, I'm going to rise. That would have been very difficult to hear based on the image that they probably were forming in their minds as Jews who knew these prophecies and learned them as children when they came to realize that Jesus was the Messiah. They were probably waiting for like, yeah, thunder, lightning, like stuff coming down from heaven. Finally, we will get our vengeance and our justice on Rome. But no, he spoke this openly. And so what does Peter do? He took him aside and began to rebuke him. Notice that in verse 31, he began to teach them. And then Peter, he began to rebuke him. That is his response. And this is 
interesting that Peter would step up and rebuke Jesus. That's bold, because Peter just acknowledged Jesus is the Messiah. So he's saying, you're the Messiah, but I'm going to rebuke you for a second, because I think, like, that's a bold, tenacious thing to do. Now, whether it's, like, stupid or wise, you know, uh, we see that it doesn't work out too well. Uh, we get a little insight into Peter's personality, and I like that because it's very similar to our personality. Like, we get bullheaded, we get set on our plan, our idea of how we tell God we, we want him to work. Just like the gospel for last Sunday. They say, heal this deaf man by laying hands on him. And so what does Jesus do? Something totally different. Takes him away, wet willies his ears, spits on his tongue, and heals him that way. Very bizarre. So, Jesus sometimes is going to do the thing that isn't expected. In fact, I think most of the time. And so 33, at this, Jesus turned around and looking at his disciples, so in front of everybody else, you've just been told in the account of Matthew, we have this, that you are going to be the leader of all these disciples, all these apostles, and you're going to get scolded in front of the whole class, even though you were the straight A student, teacher's pet. Here we go. Looking at his disciples, rebuked Peter, gives it right back to him and said, get behind me, Satan. This is a pretty difficult verse. You know, Peter is called Satan here. And Peter, being one of the primary sources for Mark, doesn't leave this out. Like, this is an eyewitness testimony, probably very much from the mouth of Peter to Mark himself, who was like, no, leave that in there. It's important people know that. And why? Is it because he wants people to think that maybe he's in league with the devil? No. So, first of all, Satan, Satana, the word means adversary, or like someone who is against me. Sometimes it's translated as enemy, but it means like Peter here is an adversary in this moment to what Jesus has just said that he's trying to do. So what does he say to him? He says, get behind me. Now that phrase behind me is opisomu, and it's the same phrase in chapter one of Mark where Jesus tells Peter and Andrew in verse 17, come follow me, come after me. So it's not that he's saying, you know, go away from me, get behind me, Peter, like get, get out of here. He's saying, take back your proper position behind me as a follower, because I know the mission I've come here to do. Instead, Peter steps out in front of him and tries to take the lead. But that's not the role of a disciple. The role of a disciple is to follow their rabbi so closely that the blessing at the time was maybe covered in the dust of your rabbi. You were with your rabbi, you wanted to become like your rabbi, and eventually do what your rabbi did. Peter is stepping out of that position as a student, as an apprentice in the way of Jesus, and trying to circumvent his own ability to be in charge. Trying to circumvent Jesus and be in charge. And that's not the way that it goes. And Jesus corrects him, but he doesn't say go away. He says, get back in your proper position. Get behind me, because right now you're an adversary to me. That is where every apprentice, every Christian, everyone on the way, everyone who calls themselves Christian or Catholic belongs behind Jesus, following where he's leading. But I think a lot of times we step in front of Jesus and we say, Jesus, what the heck are you doing? Or here's my plan, like I really need you to do this, or I really want this, Jesus. Can you please just get, give it to me already? That's what I'm talking about, our personally curated version of God or of Jesus. He's not a vending machine. He's not Santa Claus. He's not a therapist to make us feel better. He is our Savior. And if we don't acknowledge that we need saving, that we cannot figure this out on our own, and that every good thing we have is a gift from above, only given to us through the mercy of Jesus through his resurrection and crucifixion, if we don't realize that, then we're Christian for all the wrong reasons. Who do you say that I am? You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. Human beings, we all know, we want our way, we like control, we don't want things to change, we want to be in charge, we want things to be comfortable, cozy, good, our own personally curated version of the Messiah. And that is not the way that it is. Jesus summoned the crowd, so there was a crowd there with his disciples, he summons them to come around, and he kind of, have you ever had this happen where you're in class and you do something that maybe only the teacher sees? And then the teacher does this thing where like, all right, everybody, I just got to make an announcement. There's a new rule or like, and you know, like, oh, great. This is about me. Like, you know, this is kind of like what Jesus is doing, but it's kind of merciful. He's not calling him out. He does rebuke him in front of the other disciples because I think that was necessary for his own humility for the disciples to learn. Then he calls the crowds around him to say and acknowledge like, 
look, you all probably have this image as well of the Messiah being this powerful person, and this is going to be a glorious road to Jerusalem, and I'm just going to, you know, zap the Roman legions there out of existence, and all of the Hebrew authority that's oppressed you with their oral laws, we're going to restore the glory of the good old days. Well, guess what? That's not what's going to happen. And so Jesus gives here conditions for discipleship, conditions for following him, getting behind him, coming after him. He said to them, whoever wishes to come after me, okay, there's that phrase again, same thing as behind me, get behind me, it's come after me, adversary. That's the same uh, phrase in Greek. Must deny himself. Okay, this is not a glorious posse where you're going to get, you know, all the lavish riches and food and wine and women and all the glorious things of victory that we read about in these old conquests of the Holy Land in Joshua and Judges and First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles and this glorious kingdom of Israel. No, you must deny yourself. You have to be humble. You have to follow in the footsteps of Jesus to get back behind him. And then he says this, to take up his cross and follow me, meaning being behind me. Take up his cross. Remember, this is being written at a time 30 years after Jesus has already risen from the dead. And the Christian church is already established in many different cities, and they're being heavily persecuted by Rome and by other governing authorities. And so to be reminded in this, like, no, it's not going to be like the glorious, good, comfortable days of before. We need to take up our cross. We need to acknowledge there is purpose in our suffering because there was ultimate purpose in the suffering of Jesus Christ. And when we suffer well, our attitude toward our suffering can be redemptive. It can be powerful. It can transform our life and the lives of those who witness it. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. And the word fear for life is psyching, which is like your natural life. Sometimes there's other places where it says um, save his soul, um, but soul is more of like our eternal life. So this is specifically using it in Greek, our natural life. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, meaning whoever is willing to kind of give this life up, give all these earthly attachments, the idea for achievement, self-gratification, competition, getting as far as you possibly can, getting as much influence, popularity, money, achievement, being the CEO, however many zeros at the end of your paycheck, all that stuff, if you're willing to let that go for the sake of Jesus and the sake of the gospel, you will be saved. And that addition there, that of the gospel, the good news, the word there in Greek, euangelio, evangelistic, evangelizing, willing to save willing to acknowledge our need for salvation and say, I want everyone else to know about this, so I'm going to turn away from all these earthly assumptions of things that I should be doing, ways I should be living, things I should be pursuing, and I'm going to help others to know there's something greater than that. That all those things lead to despair, lead to sins, bad habits, vices, poor behaviors, but there's something greater. And that if we even want to begin to step over those tendencies we have, those desires, to something greater, we cannot do it without the mercy of Jesus Christ. He came and did it for us. Even though we deserve punishment for all those mistakes that we've made, all the bad things that we've done, all the ways we separated ourselves from God, Jesus came and paid that debt for us. And there are so many people out there who are living lives rooted in hopelessness, feel like they are empty, they have no meaning, nothing to live for, because they're paying attention to earthly standards and goals. If we are willing to detach ourselves from the importance of those things for the sake of Jesus and his good news, his gospel, that he came to save us, will not only save our lives, but others will be saved too. And I think that is our challenge, our commission in hearing the gospel this week. Am I willing to let go of the attachments I have to my personally curated version of Jesus? Who do I say that he is? And do I let that challenge me in a way that I follow him, that I don't try and get in front of him and say, no, I rebuke you. I want it this way. Or why is it happening this way? Why don't I understand? No, just to follow where he leads and be willing to give up earthly attachment, earthly pursuits, earthly goals for something greater, something higher, something divine and eternal to acknowledge that Jesus Christ came and paid the ultimate price for you and for me 
so that we could have eternal life with him in heaven. And every good thing that we have in our life is from him. The only thing that we claim ownership of is our sin. And guess what? He came and took care of that for us too. So if we acknowledge that and submit ourselves to God and say, God, I want to follow you. I want to be part of that. I want to be on that path that you carved for me by the blood that you shed on the cross. Then we get behind him and we follow. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. We take up our cross, we deny ourselves, and we follow him every single day. If we're willing to detach ourselves from earthly things, from attachments, desires, achievements, and to do all that for his sake and for the sake of the good news so that other people will be on board and know this, that is the key to happiness in life as a Christian, as a person. That's what matters. And so I pray that we could use that as a lens to look at our own life and say, is my life aligned to that? What am I looking for? What am I chasing after? And who do I say that Jesus is? Is he someone I just go to when I need more of that stuff? When I'm worried about having more money, achievement, success at work, when stuff is going wrong? Is he my first choice or my last resort? And if he's my first choice, I should probably start listening and following a whole lot more than I'm trying to tell him what to do or what my plans are. So, I pray that that was a blessing to you. I pray that this gospel continues to bless you as you read it throughout the week and as you hear it proclaimed again this coming Sunday. I pray that it challenges you in new ways. Please leave your reflections, your comments, and questions in the, in the chat and in the comments below. Make sure you like and subscribe this video. Uh, let us know what you think of this Bible study. And we will be back in person next Monday, September 13th, in the upper room or on Zoom. We would love for you to join us, and I really hope that you will invite someone to come with you. That is one way that we can begin to detach from that earthly avoidance of shame or fear or what will they say about me for the sake of Jesus and the gospel. Because I guarantee you, you know at least five people in your life, in your family, who need that kind of hope, who need to hear words of encouragement like this, or who need to be challenged in their own faith to be more authentic to who Christ is calling them to be. So invite people to come and be part of this family. And as we are challenged to do that, let us pray together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for putting up with the fact that we all have these distorted versions of you, and yet still you love us, you chase after us, and you call out to us for more, to follow you more faithfully. And so we pray, God, that we would come to you in prayer this week, not with a laundry list of things we need for you to do, or complaints, or things that we feel we are owed, but a laundry list of opportunities to praise you and be grateful for what you have given us. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you do. Help us to persevere in following you, to always remember that we are not in front, that we are following, following you, and sometimes that means to trust. When we can't see around the next bend, when we can't even determine where the path is, to just keep looking at the person in front of us, that, that is you faithfully leading us to the next, next place, the next place where we experience the greatest possible good that you can bring about at this season of our lives. It might be difficult. It might be a path that involves suffering to traverse and get there. So we pray, God, that we would be able to deny ourselves to take up our cross and to follow you each and every day, however you're calling us to. We pray all of these things in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs>